Welcome to a special edition of In Focus on WSIU. I'm Jennifer Fuller. The results are in, most ballots are counted, and so we're taking a closer look at the general election from 2022. Our guests on this special edition of In Focus are Jack Titchener, the host of Illinois Lawmakers on Illinois Public Television, and John Jackson, a visiting professor in the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at SIU Carbondale. Gentlemen, thanks for coming in. Thanks for inviting us. It's good to be here. We still have a lot of question marks over this election, but there are some things that are decided. Jack, I'm going to open things up with you. If we look at things on a national and then on a statewide level, any big surprises? Uh, in Illinois in particular, I think there were some surprises. There was a lot of talk, uh, both nationwide and locally, about a Republican red wave that was just going to blow the Democrats out of the water. That did not happen in the state of Illinois. Democrats carried all of the congressional, excuse me, all the constitutional offices in the state of Illinois, starting with J.B. Pritzker. Tammy Duckworth easily won re-election to uh, her seat in the U.S. Senate. Uh, you go down the list, uh, all of the statewide officers won re-election handily. Um, the Democrats picked up two congressional seats in the state of Illinois. Um, and uh, that Supreme Court race, they won two of the contested races there. Uh, and it, it looks like at this point, both races are in Democratic hands, although one, uh, the Mary Kay O'Brien and um, uh, Ed Burke uh, race is still too close to call at this point. But Certainly. that's critical for issues like pension reform and potential for uh, reproductive rights legislation getting to uh, the Illinois top court. It's always important to note for voters, too, that the election will not be certified in the state of Illinois until two weeks mm -hmm. after the ballots are cast. So we're talking about the week of Thanksgiving before we'll know for sure how these races settled out. John, Jack mentioned that there was this projection of a big red wave. That's what we typically see in a midterm election. The party out of power surges and many ta times takes control of, of Congress. That didn't materialize this year. Well, it was interesting. At the early stages, there was the big red wave prediction. Then it kind of tailed off in the national narrative. It looked like more and more competitive uh, because of the quality of the candidates and particularly the Senate uh, races. But then the last two weeks, that's all you could hear. The national media went berserk over the red wave thesis and the Republican Party, of course, were egging them on with that. And it is true that the late breaking votes often break in a kind of a wave because they disproportionately go one way and it looked that would be the Republican boost they needed to get over the top. Well, that last push didn't happen. It turned out that the Democrats were well situated to hang on. They're not going to hang on by much, but likely uh, hang on to the U.S. Senate, and even if they don't win the House, which I don't think they will, it's going to be much closer. It's right now at about 222, 223 for the Republicans. Uh, Kevin McCarthy was talking about 20, 25, 30 vote margin. He's not going to get that. The average since World War II is plus 25 in a midterm election and first term presidency. So all he had to do was do the average. Uh, he's not gonna get that, so it's probably going to be a very divided government with the House somewhat narrowly under control of the Republicans and the Senate still a toss up, but maybe a 50-50 or a 51-49 advantage Democrats. Now that certainly slows down President Biden's legislative agenda, Absolutely. if not stalls it all together. What are you looking for in the next, say, year to 18 months before all of these elections spin up again? A huge conflict. Uh, the House, is, if it uh, is Republican, and I think it will be, is going to go after Biden, there are going to be lots of hearings, there are going to be lots of investigations. Uh, they've already talked about all the things they want to do, and they've got the power now of subpoena and chairing all those committees. Uh, even with a narrow margin, the House is going to really give Biden fits. So the question will be, where is the Senate on this? The conflict has been intense, and it's going to ramp up. 
heading toward 2024. Talking about the red wave in Illinois, it kind of failed to materialize because of a number of factors. The uh, anti safety act uh, rhetoric coming from the Republicans up and down the tickets uh, pretty well seems to have fallen flat. It did not uh, seem to resonate too well with the public at large. Uh, there, there was also a concerted effort on the part of J.B. Pritzker and the other uh, Democrats running for office this time around to focus on the fact that they were the party for reproductive health rights in the state of Illinois after the Supreme Court turned over or overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, the anti-Madigan rhetoric that's always been a part of things for the last few years also didn't really go anywhere either because Madigan's left the scene some two years ago. And so that's that's kind of where we are with that. Uh, Darren Bailey beating up on Chicago consistently, despite the fact that's where most of the state's population lives in that area, uh, also did not go well, over very well. Do you see that that issues are now becoming more important to voters rather than specific candidates, or is this just an election that we're going to continue to study and learn from? I think uh, I think John's probably the scholar on that. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right. I think the issues are going to dominate things. Uh, and this, this brings me to a, a question of John. Uh, Prisker campaigned on the idea that the state has finally turned the corner on the economy. Um, we're paying our bills on time now. We're putting more money into pensions and the unemployment trust fund. Um, the uh, rainy day fund is also growing. And there was a sense for years when I was at the Simon Institute, and, and you've been there for a long time, John, that the polling that the Simon Institute always did showed that the majority of Illinoisans, up to upwards of what, 75% or so, said Illinois is going in the wrong direction. The polling nowadays is starting to show that trend starting to flip over. Yeah, you've got to have something to back up your claims of what you're running on. And the governor was clearly running on his record. and. It's a record that uh, he could defend and with a great deal of credibility for all of the reasons you cited. As you know, under Governor Rauner, we had a very gridlocked, dysfunctional state government. We couldn't even adopt a budget for two years and higher education, for example, still trying to get over those years. So the functioning of the government got a lot smoother under United Government and they got a lot of things done and it turns out there were a lot of things that people approved of and believed the governor as he campaigned on them. John, if we can get a little bit further into this issue of polling, we saw two years ago and we've seen again this year, polls coming out showing something that we might project and then when the votes get cast, it doesn't really materialize. So. How much impact should we watch for in terms of polling leading up to elections, whether it's on public sentiment on an issue or on a specific candidate? Well, I've been a pollster, so I usually defend the polls, but let me say it's getting harder and harder to do. It's getting harder and harder to set up the sample correctly. And so the polls have always not done what some people claim, including pollsters, they're doing, and that is a very precise measurement. It's always been the error factor, and what is the margin of error, usually plus or minus three or four. So people didn't listen to that, and most of these polls have been in the plus or minus three or four. So we have oversold how precise we can be, <laughs> and it's clear that it's getting tougher and tougher just to get people to answer phone is getting tougher. So take the polling uh, with something of a grain of salt again with this example last night. Let's get a little bit into, we talked about the national parties and how they're going to try and, and impact government at the national level. Jack, when you look at the control of the state legislature, uh, it appears, of course, uh, we, we expected that Democrats would, regain, would t retain control of both the House and the Senate. You mentioned that they swept the constitutional offices. But what's the balance of power now in the legislature? This was where, to me, this was the really big surprise. I had thought, you know, given some of the polling that and the uh, kind of common, uh, I guess, uh, uh, conventional wisdom was that uh, House Democrats may lose a few seats. They have a 73 vote uh, supermajority right now. In fact, House Democrats 
won five Republican seats on Tuesday. Uh, and they lost one seat for a net gain of four seats. So they're going up to 77 votes in the Illinois House. In the Senate, uh, it looks like they might possibly lose two of their 41-vote supermajority. Senator Mike Hastings, who uh, had uh, a, an, uphill uh, an uphill battle uh, because of some of the revelations that came about uh, from some of his divorce proceedings, uh, uh, is within a few votes of uh, still leading his race, but there are still, uh, as you said earlier, Jennifer, uh, we won't have the certified uh, results for another two weeks. So those mail-in ballots and the early voting, uh, that's still a very close one. There's another one that is also, uh, he was an appointed state senator uh, named Tharp. Uh, he is trailing and is, it's not likely that he's going to pick up uh, or close the gap there. So for, House and Senate Democrats, it was a big night overall. They maintained their super majorities. The House grew theirs a bit. Uh, I think it was also a very uh, good night for the new House Speaker, a relatively new House Speaker, Chris Welch. A lot of folks going into this contest wondered if he could generate the kind of ground game that the former Speaker, Mike Madigan, uh, was able to uh, generate for years for Democratic candidates. There was a, a kind of a consensus that a lot of the Democrats didn't have to really work that hard because Madigan had a, such a fantastic ground game. Speaker Welch uh, in, on the Illinois Lawmakers Program not so long ago said, well, it comes down to this. We're going to have to win. Winners do the work. And uh, he pressed that home. He also uh, did well in fundraising and uh, true uh, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker did help the House candidates out there and the Senate candidates. In fact, all up and down the slate, uh, Pritzker was a huge force in terms of uh, providing adequate funding for Democratic candidates. That was. Just, could I just add to that? I think sure. the other thing people have missed is how closely the governor and the speaker have been working together, how well they've uh, coordinated, uh, how well they get along on when push comes to shove on things like the state party chair. Uh, Chris Welch supported the governor's position on that, which was a surprise to some folks. And I think that illustrates how much he's taken control of the House, but I don't think it's the kind of authoritarian at the top decision making that was more uh, relevant to the Madigan era. It's really easy to talk about the Democratic Party and its successes in Illinois. There's been a lot of publicity about how the Democratic Party would organize itself mm -hmm. once Michael Madigan was out of the picture. But what about the Republican Party? When you see losses like this, what will we see from the GOP on the state level? Well, we're already seeing uh, one thunderbolt this morning uh, in the uh, wake of them losing five House seats. Um, the House uh, Republican leader Jim Durkin announced this morning that he is not going to run for re-election as House Republican leader uh, in the next session of the Illinois General Assembly. Uh, there's been an ongoing battle there in recent weeks with uh, another state representative from uh, Northern Illinois, Tim Ozinga, whose uh, family is big in the concrete business up there and has deep pockets of his own. I believe earlier this week, he came up with a million dollars of his own for Republican candidates. And I think uh, at this point, he appears to be the front runner for the House Republican leadership uh, post. What does that mean, though, when you talk about a supermajority in the chambers for Democrats? You saw 20 years ago or so a shared government where there had to be a lot of negotiation, mm -hmm. a lot of horse trading in order to get these bills passed, in order to get a budget passed. But with large majorities for Democrats, do the Republicans have a say in these bills? It will come down to uh, issues like a capital bill where there's something for, if you will, something almost for everyone in one of those bills. Uh, you'll, we did see Republican support for the uh, uh, capital bill that was passed in uh, Pritzker's first term. Um, there'll be some issues like that that they can find uh, support for. A, a good example was the gaming expansion that saw the new casino go to uh, 
Walker's Bluff here. Uh, a good show of bipartisanship there. You had uh, Jay Hoffman, the assistant House Majority Leader from the Metro East area, uh, push that bill on uh, on his side of the aisle. Then you had Republicans uh, like Terry Bryant, uh, Dale Fowler, and the like pushing that bill on the, the, the Senate Republican side and House lawmakers as well. Sure. I wanted to get to the Trump factor when it comes to Republican politics at the state level and then at the national level. And John, I'll start with you. There's a lot of talk following this election about whether or not former President Trump had the impact that he hoped to have. We saw in races like the Pennsylvania Senate race, for example, where his hand-picked candidate didn't do as well as he would have liked. So what kind of impact does Donald Trump still have on the GOP and what do you expect in the next couple of years? Well, I think he's still got a very strong hold over the GOP and if he runs, he's probably going to get the nomination. But uh, that being said, I think uh, the president was trying constantly to say this is a choice, not a referendum. And it's not just a referendum on me and my job approval ratings, which he knew were not that great. And to the extent he and other Democrats were able to get that choice, not a referendum message over, it helped them. Because every time it's a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Joe Biden wins and the Democrats win on that. And it didn't really carry the day. It wasn't certainly not a blue wave last night, but it helped protect the Democrats and by implication helped protect Biden. And I think the most crucial thing about reinforcing that was 24 hours out in Ohio campaigning for J.D. Vance, Trump effectively announced that he's running again. And I'm just going to tell you for sure in one week, which is a week from yesterday. So all of that sort of subtle reinforcement of the Democratic message came roaring back 24 hours or less than that before the polls opened, which the Republicans didn't need or want and the Democrats welcomed. Jack, what about on a statewide level? Does President Trump's impact on the Republican Party have a hold and, and will oh. it continue to dominate? Oh, indeed it does. Uh, because a lot of the downstate Republicans, uh, certainly Trump supporters, Darren Bailey uh, helped, uh, certainly got some help with that last minute endorsement by Donald Trump to uh, seal the deal uh, for uh, his uh, winning the Republican nomination for governor, uh, he will definitely be a force to contend with uh, if, if he does make, in, uh, in fact, make good on that uh, promise to, to run again. Also on the national level, we could see a, a battle there for the nomination for the Republicans. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis, who won re-election this week, uh, perhaps challenging Donald Trump. There has already been words exchanged uh, between the two potential candidates. And we also see on the national scene that the Democrats may see a candidate from Illinois in J.B. Pritzker. Is it too early to start talking about all of this? No, it starts today, right now. It even started before the election. DeSantis could make a run for it and could make it interesting. I don't see another Republican that could. Uh, so it's either DeSantis or nobody if there's a stop Trump movement in my estimation. Uh, on the Democratic side, I don't think uh, the governor will run, certainly not if the president announces. I don't think Democrats will have an effective challenge in the primaries. But if Joe Biden decides to step aside, it's Katie bar the door and Democrats don't have any odds on favorite, but I would handicap the governor of California is probably the most likely, but the governor of Illinois will be in the top five of that list. And potentially the vice president herself. Yes, she will be in the top five. Sure, sure. Jack, there was what about one un unpleasant surprise for House Democrats in Illinois last night, and that is in the Metro East area where the assistant House Majority Leader Latoya Greenwood appears to be uh, trailing uh, significantly in her race. Now, the ballots are not all counted as we sit down to record this on a, on a Wednesday, but she's got an awful lot of ground to make up there. And that's also an area where former President Trump did much better in uh, some respects. 
in the Metro East area. That's somewhat surprising, Jack, mm -hmm. when you look at that area historically, which used to be a very strong Democratic yes. area. We see uh, lawmakers like Dick Durbin are from the Metro East right. originally, and, and it always used to be a very powerful part of Illinois' 12th Congressional District, as well as others in the outlying areas. What's changed there? A lot of it comes down to uh, the loss of manufacturing jobs, the, the oil pain union jobs that were always kind of the backbone of the Democratic Party in, in southern Illinois and in the Metro East in particular. Well, and cultural issues. Yes, sir. And as a result of all of that, uh, Southern Illinois continues an inexorable march to the right and to the Republican Party. Just look at Williamson County last night and look at the uh, county superintendent race. Uh, uh, there's not a standing Republican left in the courthouse in Williamson now except for the uh, coroner and the commission's all Republican now. And that's what's happened across Southern Illinois. So we're increasingly out of step with the rest of the state. When it comes to the rest of the state, though, you look at Illinois on a, on a political map mm -hmm. and you see a blue state surrounded by a sea yeah. of red. Does Illinois shift in your mind to something that looks a little more purple or perhaps a little more red? Not anytime soon. It's just southern Illinois and some parts of central Illinois, but Illinois as a whole is dominated by northeast Illinois because that's where the votes are and it's dominated by the urban other uh, cities and uh, Pritzker took 15 of those and Durbin took 15 of those when he ran and that's a core that the other, whatever that math is, uh, the other 88 can't do enough to overcome. Jack, it oversimplifies things, but elections all come down to turnout. Mm -hmm. Who turns out, how much they turn out, all of those numbers add up to what we get in an election result. We saw results, at least on the local level this week, that averaged anywhere from 40% to upwards of 70% right. turnout for a midterm election, that's actually pretty high. It is, and, and part of that comes down to uh, issues on the ballot like the uh, home rule uh, uh, question in the city of Carbondale, which won overwhelmingly. Uh, you'll have things like that that will drive voter turnout. You'll have some interesting down the ticket ballot, uh, down the ticket uh, races that'll capture some imagination. I don't know that the, the turnout though overall was that high in the state of Illinois uh, uh, when it comes to the overall turnout. What do you expect, John, when it comes to turnout? What do the parties need to do to engage the voters and make sure that they come out consistent, consistently? A spike in one election does not make for a mandate when you see two years later something very different. Yeah, political scientists and journalists always say it comes down to turnout at the end, and it always does. It's a truism now and getting your people to the polls, terribly important. Republicans are somewhat better historically at that than Democrats are. But I think the Democrats matched that and probably when the analyses are made, all of that early voting was sort of silently building up an advantage for the Democrats that really wasn't evident, but became evident as this thing unfolds. And so I think that's one reason that it's possible the Democrats may win enough contests to control the Senate. Uh, I just think the early voters are predominantly going to be breaking for the Democrats as it turns out, and that's what saved their bacon. And I think the issue again of reproductive health was certainly very strong uh, for uh, women in particular in the state of Illinois, and that was a, that was a message that J.B. Pritzker and the rest of the slate kept hammering home for months, if uh, for not weeks, if not months. Sure. As we have just a few minutes remaining and we look ahead to the next couple of years, two years until the next presidential election, there's a lot of talk of voter fatigue. People are tired of hearing and seeing all these ads and attacks. But what do the parties need to do over the next 18 months to make sure that their issues remain at the forefront or are brought to the forefront. And Jack, I'll start with you. Well, in the state of Illinois, Republicans are going to have to get some deep pockets uh, to help them. Uh, 
after uh, Richard Irvin appeared headed for a loss in the Republican gubernatorial primary to Darren Bailey, uh, Ken Griffin, the multi-billionaire, pulled out his support. He pulled up stakes and, and moved his company to, to Florida, uh, as well as a uh, number of folks have done so. Uh, Bruce Rauner, for example. Once Bruce Rauner and Ken Griffin lost, left the playing field, about the only man left standing was Richard Ulean, who's a very conservative activist in the Republican Party, pumped millions of dollars into the Republican primaries and the general election effort. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what Tim Ozinga can do in terms of fundraising overall for the Republicans in the state of Illinois. Less than a minute for you, John. I think Joe Biden will continue to do what he's been doing. That is, he will try to bargain with the Republicans when he can. He'll try to find common ground when he can. Occasionally, they may be able to compromise, but most of the time, it's not going to work and we're going to have more gridlock than compromise. Big elections mean big issues to talk about. I want to thank Jack Titchener, the host of Illinois Lawmakers on public television, and John Jackson, visiting professor at uh, the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at SIU Carbondale. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of In Focus on WSIU. You can find all of our episodes by going to our website, WSIU.org, and find us on our YouTube channel where you can subscribe. I'm Jennifer Fuller. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time.